this is a sneeze. <laughs> this is uh, this particular species. So that will is the process. That's in the future, or perhaps not even in the future. It might actually exist. I don't. Know. <coughs> there are prototypes. There are prototypes. Yeah. I guess that. <laughs> That's fine. Well, you may need to go to the field, which takes a lot of effort, as we saw, and that probably has medium difficulty, new field surveys, or some kind of new kind of remote sensing that you might plan. And uh, it will be hard, but eventually it might happen that some currently inaccessible sites might eventually be reached, such as volcanoes or the subso subsoil, uh, the bottom of the, of, of the ocean. Do you know how many times we've been in the moon? I mean, some people have been on the moon. Well, I'm continuously in the moon, but it's uh, different. It's, it's a way of thinking. <laughs> how many trips have been done by humans to the moon, to the moon so far? Remember? I remember staying up all night waiting <coughs> for Armstrong stepping on that. <laughs> Six times. Okay. How many times have we been to the deepest bottom of the ocean? Guess. It's much closer. It's only, it's only 11 kilometers down rather than 300,000 kilometers outside the atmosphere. How many times? No guess? Twice. First time in 1960. An enormous machine which was basically a bag of fuel that provide, that provide buoyancy and had a <coughs> ball, a ball of steel, well, yes, it was steel hanging down. They went down, when they hit the bottom, an enormous cloud of lime went out, so they couldn't see anything, and they had to go up. That was in the 60s. The second time was two years ago, when a very, very, very wealthy uh, film director, James Cameron, made his own uh, very, very little, little cramped uh, submarine and went to the same place with a host of cameras to film whatever was there. I'm rather suspicious that something went wrong because no single foot of film has been released yet. <laughs> so there are still places where we haven't yet been. Okay? Now, this is an ideal <coughs> procedure for gap control, which means how should we deal with the gaps? We should start here and then do some kind of gap detection. We should try to find a gap. And uh, normally, first time, we'll see that if there is a gap, this gap is not filled. If it's filled, it's because there is, a no, there is not a gap, so we can end right there. But if it's not filled, we might try to fill the gap. Obviously, the easiest way to try to fill the gap is look if there is DAC available, if there is digital knowledge available. If there is, we try to fill or to source from DAC. But when, whenever we fill a gap from DAC and it's available, we have, we have to go back to gap detection because by filling a gap, we might perhaps open a different gap. So it will continuously cycle until we are sure that the gap is filled. If there is, not, if there is no DAC available, then we try to get to, a something, to something slightly harder, which is trying to get existing data in hard formats into digital formats. I call this DACifying gray data. If there aren't any gray data that could be the DACified and then go back to the cycle and eventually end, then we are stuck to field work. We have to go out and collect the data. But again, once we have the data, <coughs> we have to repeat the gap detection analysis to see whether we have filled the gap or not. Now, what types of gaps we're dealing with in, in primary records? First, taxonomical gaps. <coughs> I'm going to go to the three main gaps. There are many more. What's a taxonomical gap? It's something that arises from what practitioners call the taxonomical impediment or taxonomic impediment. The amount of wisdom, of knowledge about taxonomy 
is not increasing, it's actually decreasing. Because taxonomy is south over the shoulder by many funding agencies, because it's not, it's not nice enough, it doesn't have enough buttons or enough lights to it. It's, it's, it's done by people sitting in their labs, going out to the field, collecting data with, with a lot of difficulty, and then spending hours and hours and days and months and years trying to distinguish one bug, one bug from another bug. So it's not shiny. It tends not to be funded, which means that the amount of trained taxonomists is actually di diminishing. It doesn't have much of a recruit. So what we know about taxonomy is basically partial. Some data are known, some data are not known. There's also something else which, is, which I call inadequate knowledge transfer. The knowledge might be there, but sometimes the taxonomical knowledge uh, requires, again, some kind of taxonomical expertise to wade through the sea of redenominations, synonymizations, and new combinations of species is normally a nightmare unless you are a specialist in this group. The second type of, of gaps are time gaps, <coughs> which might mean that the cycle, the natural cycles, are not covered. For instance, if we are, want to know something about a uh, certain species or number of species, that have a natural cycle that appear in summer, disappear in winter, and we don't have, we only have winter data, we basically will know nothing about the species. <coughs> There's also the limited span that Tom explained before. We might only have data from a certain period of time. Last, those are the geography gaps that Tom explained in, in, in in the previous talk, which might include shallow coverage, which might include spotty coverage, good coverage but in a very few places, or biased coverage. You are leaving in the field some data that you could have collected. Or generalized coverage. You get data from very general areas that will offer you little or no information at the level of detail at the regional or local level. <coughs> to give you an idea of how much or how many gaps you might find even in supposedly public and curated data, let's look at this plot here. <coughs> this plot here explains how the data that are available about Spain in GBIF indexes has been completed. We have the geospatial sector, the date sector, and the taxonomy sector. Over this axis here, what we have is the amount of data sets that are complete or partially complete. So these columns here are the number of data sets that have the geospatial data complete, which means they have coordinates, they have a datum, so they can be uh, well located in space. The yellow one are the ones that have complete dates for their findings. <coughs> and the red one, they have complete taxonomies. That's what we should expect. We actually should expect that we only have these columns and we don't have those columns. But those columns have uh, represent the number of data sets that might have no data or only at partial amount of data in the records. 60% means that 60% <coughs> of the data are complete, of the data records are complete, which means that 40% are not complete, are lacking something, are lacking coordinates, are lacking taxonomy, are lacking or having bad dates or whatever. So there are gaps everywhere. Let's go to the taxon data gaps. As I, so, as I told, before, told you before, this arises from the taxonomical impediment a worldwide shortage of taxonomical information, as defined in, in Carvalho and others, <coughs> in evaluation of biology, that leads to gaps in taxonomical knowledge and in a vicious cycle to a shortage of trained taxonomists. 
If we represented the amount, the number of species in the world of organisms according to group, what is the most diverse group in the world? Do you remember which, which one it is? Which group of organisms is the most diverse? As, as known from the current taxonomy. Insects. That's correct. Insects. And within insects? Bugs. Coleoptera. Mm -hmm. yeah. Coleoptera. Yeah. Hmm? Right? <laughs> this was represented by Bob May in, in this very nice picture in which the size of the icon represents the number of, of known species known in the current taxonomy. This is completely wrong in a sense because now we know that the most, the highest diversity is in the bacteria, but we won't go into that. Okay, so insects is the most diverse group. The next one is plants, upper plants, and the next one, the third one, are crabs, of which we know just a few species, the ones that we eat. And then the next one are snails, and then fungi, and then protozoans. This might be also false, because that's what we know about protozoans, <coughs> but we know that we don't know a thing about protozoans. Algae, fish, that's the first vertebrate. Uh, flat uh, worms, worms, round worms, uh, uh, birds, uh, uh, medusa, uh, jellyfish, reptiles, uh, starfish, sponge, uh, I don't know what it is. <coughs> <laughs> So, so it's, it's an invertebrate, but I don't, know, I, I don't know which one. Uh, yeah, frogs or amphibia, and lastly, mammals. However, if we wanted to, if we started to say names of animals here, except for plants, because you know thousands of plants, we'll probably be able to name two times, twice, or three times, or four times as many vertebrates and mammals as anybody, else, as anything else. That's right. And what we internally know, we know a lot about vertebrates, we know less about invertebrates, is actually what exists in the current knowledge, in the data sets. Let's look at this tree map. This is a tree map. The surface, oh, sorry. <coughs> Come on, where are you? Yeah, here. A tree map is a representation of the amount of entities or in this case the amount of records the size of each tile is proportional <coughs> to the amount of records that exist in this case in GBIF. what we see here is that most data are basically births that's what we more we know more I have a different um, <coughs> uh, a different um, team up for species names it's different but we won't go into that those are plants, the green things, <coughs> and those are other taxa, which means almost anything else. Those are fish, and those are insects. Insects should be by far the largest group. However, most records are basically birds. So there is a discrepancy, discrepancy between what we should know and what we know. We should know a lot about insects and plants, but we do know a lot about birds. Sorry. <laughs> <coughs> but this is what it is, thanks to the work of, of ornithologists. Which solutions do we have? OK, we might resort to names and taxonomies, global initiatives that will provide us with, with uh, names, with my, which might provide, this, provide us with name or solution, as we did in yesterday's exercise. We can go to GBIF, we can go to Encyclopedia of Life, to Catalog of Life, Taxamatch, and other, and other tools that will help us finding species names, but they will not resolve the very basics of the thing. We need to attribute content to the taxonomy, and that will always depend on taxonomists. We're back to the taxonomical impediment. We don't have taxonomists, this up there will come to nothing eventually. And most species, actually remain unknown. <coughs> how many species do we know? How many species have received names? You remember? It's about 1.5, 1.8 million. But 1.8. How many species are out there waiting to be discovered? 
there are several estimates. <coughs> so, what, what is your guess, unless you know the estimate? How many species are there out to be discovered? It's millions. The estimates, the estimates vary a lot, but they go from a lower bound of 5 million up to a <coughs> an upper bound. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> an upper bound of 20 of 100 million. And a, a finally common or accepted estimate is 20 million of existing species. That doesn't count the species that have already disappeared. Because <coughs> most species actually are there no more. They have disappeared. What was the last time you saw a living trilobite? 